Okay, well, if you got your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Ephesians. When you find your place, please stand. You know, sometimes after the movie, we uh, get a little bit sleepy. So stand up, stretch out. I've got about a two-hour message, so just kidding. If you're visiting with us, we usually go to about 12, but sometimes I am long-winded, so I'll admit that. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Feeling the love this morning. All right, Ephesians chapter number three. I don't know if I said that or not. Ephesians chapter number three. We're going to be looking at verses 10 to 13. I'll give you a second. Ephesians chapter three, verses 10 to 13. Oh, yeah, and another announcement. Next week, we'll have a missionary with us. So uh, heads up for that. Ephesians chapter three. I don't see any pages turn. We'll go ahead and read. Verse 10 says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory." Lord, we love you. Uh, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, I humbly ask you for you to help me. I pray that you will fill me with your spirit, speak in me and through me this morning. Help me to remember the things that you've taught me out of your word. I pray you help me to clearly communicate it to those here. Lord, I pray for those that are here this morning that do not know you, that you would convict their heart, show them their need of relationship with you. Lord, I pray for those this morning that do know you. Maybe they're going through a hard time. I pray you help them to follow your voice and to follow your plan because you have a plan, Lord, that's been set in eternity. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, you can be seated. <clears throat> have you ever had a moment that left you with questions? Going through a trial in life and the first thing you say is, what is going on? God, why did this happen? I'm sure all of us could raise our hands and say that. There's been times in our lives where we've questioned God and wondered, why is he allowing this to happen? And then sometimes, but not every time, maybe it's years down the road, it just clicks. It's like a puzzle piece that's been put together, and you look and you go, oh, now it makes sense. I didn't understand it back then, but I get it now. It makes sense. And you, you understand that God was working behind the scenes the whole time. So this morning, I need some volunteers, if I don't get this thing too, uh, too crazy here. Is anybody strong enough to hold a string? Seth, you're a, you're a labor man. You can do this. JJ, would you come up here as well, please? All right, stand here. And then JJ, I'm going to get you on the other end over here. Now, I use this on my roof, so it's a little bit tattered and torn, but it'll get, yeah. All right. Kevin, come here. Put you on the spot, buddy. All right, you guys want to scoot forward just a shade? All right. For those of you that are holding your Bibles, and for those that are being used for the illustration, you don't have this uh, luxury, but just trust me, it's in the Bible, I promise. Look at verse 11. Paul says, according to the eternal purpose, could also be translated plan, which he had purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This morning, you say, what can I boil the message down to? If I'm driving home and I'm reflecting upon everything that was said in the video and everything that we watched, what is it that I want you to take with you as you go home today? I want you to take this, that God wants us to trust him. He has a plan. God wants us to trust him. He has a plan a plan. Now I've got them holding a string up here this morning because I want this string to symbolize God's plan. As a matter of fact, it says in verse 11 that God's plan is eternal. Did you guys know that whenever man sinned in the garden, God didn't go, oh, oh now I'm going to change everything. I've got to make up this new plan. No, Paul says, and it's been revealed to him, that God has had one plan this entire time. This plan was formed in eternity past. He has had it since the beginning of time. But you say, what about when man sinned? Well, Gavin, you're going to represent the fall of mankind. It's a lot of uh, responsibility. Come down here. So let's just say, I don't know how it's going to work out well, but just pull this string down. 
This is God's plan. Everything's smooth. Man sins. And this symbolizes, Gavin here, symbolizes Cabin. That's how you say it, right? Yeah. Um, this is the fall of mankind. And then you think about every story in the Bible where sin has infiltrated somewhere, messed up something. Let's say David and Bathsheba. We'll add another little curve to the trick. What about the Tower of Babel and getting it mixed up? But just think of everything in Scripture. You think of Nebuchadnezzar being the ruler of the world, trying to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. And throughout time, time and time again, this string has just went up and down with different trials. And what is Satan's goal? Satan's goal this entire time is he has been trying to thwart the plan of God, to break God's plan. And with every trial, everything that has been going through since the beginning of time, Satan is constantly trying to add and take away from the plan. But his plan has never changed. Through God's wisdom, which we're going to look at today, God's wisdom, he has every time been able to navigate around every trial. All right, you guys can uh, go sit down. Thank you for your help. Hopefully that makes sense. So, hopefully that clears it up a little bit, but if we could boil it down, God wants you to trust him. He has a plan. There's nothing that brings comfort quite like having a plan for things. And we're going to look at three points today in verses 10 to 13. We'll get this later. That support that. In verses 10 and 11, we're going to look at we, the fact that we can trust God's eternally wise plan. And then because God has a plan, what should that do for us? Well, that should allow us to live boldly by faith in God's plan. And then lastly, I want to tell you this. Don't give up because trials and tribulations are a part of God's plan. You say, well, I thought when I got saved, everything's going to be a bed of roses and it's going to be easy. No, I'm telling you, trials are a part of life but they're also a part of God's plan. So number one, if you're taking notes, trust God's eternally wise plan. Look at verse, uh, verse 11 again. Paul says, according to the eternal purpose. As I told you earlier, this word could also be translated as plan, but this speaks of something that is fixed, it's determined, and it's unchanging. As I said earlier, when man sinned in the garden, God didn't go, oh man, I, I've got to think of something else. I've got to create an entire different plan. No, in his wisdom, he totally understood that this was going to happen. As a matter of fact, if you read through the book of Revelation, it's kind of heavy, I'll give you a warning about that. But if you read in there, you'll find there's a verse that says that Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Did you guys know that before the world was ever created, time ever existed, and eternity passed, God was so wise, so sovereign, so smart, he already knew that mankind was going to fall. And because of that opportunity, he said, I am going to send Jesus Christ to die. It was already fixed. That was his eternal purpose. And nothing takes God by surprise. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what you're facing, but I can promise you, according to the word of God, it's not taking God by surprise. It may have taken you by surprise, it may have taken me by surprise, but it has never taken God by surprise. As a matter of fact, he says in here, what allows him to have this plan go forward is his wisdom. Uh, Paul says in another passage in Corinthians, he said that the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. And this plan wasn't really understood by anybody. You can read the Old Testament and you can kind of see hints that Jesus was going to come and die especially in the book of Daniel. Go read that, you can see it clearly. But no one really understood the plan of God. No one really understood. As a matter of fact, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians as well. He said, none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they have known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Do you guys realize that if they knew that having Jesus die on a cross would have given us the ability to be free from sin and have an eternal home in heaven, they wouldn't have done it. As a matter of fact, Satan thought when he did that, he thought he had had victory over God. He thought by killing God's son, he would be the one in victory. If we still had that, song, uh, that string stuck up here, you could picture the cross, Calvary, God's son dying as probably the lowest point in history from their eyes. As a matter of fact, you look at the disciples, what they do? Most of them just went home. They thought, well, it's over. All our hopes and dreams. But God's wisdom flipped it on its head. 
This is exactly what God was using to bring about his plan. Verse 10, it says, or last message, we talked about the fact that this was hidden. But Paul says in verse 10, he said, to the, tent, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places it might be known. He says, now there has been a change in time and humanity after Jesus Christ has been crucified, that now that plan that was once hidden is no longer hidden. And there's a lot of, a lot of ways that people in spiritual beings respond to this plan. What do I mean by that? Do you guys know that in the New Testament it says that angels, when it comes to our salvation, they desire to look into it. They see Jesus dying on the cross. I mean, they are paying attention. They're like, God, what are you doing? As a matter of fact, you read the Old Testament. You guys remember the Ark of the Covenant? On the top of the covenant, there are angels with wings that touch, and they're overlooking the mercy seat. They are looking into the fact of the blood being on the covenant. They're amazed by what is going on. They see God's plan, and they think, wow. And they respond with praise to him. Now, why is that? Look at your Bibles again in verse 10. At the very end, he says, the manifold wisdom of God. This word manifold means multi-layered, intricate. It's complex. It's the same word used in the Old Testament to describe Joseph's coat of many collars. And what he's basically saying is that when it comes to God's wisdom, it isn't just something that you can narrow down. Man, this thing is multifaceted. It is so intricate, it's so complex that all other beings, all they can do is respond in awe and worship. But you guys know, there's not only good angels and those that are on God's side, but there's also demons. What have demons been doing? We talked about at the very beginning. Satan and his plan has always been to either thwart and oppose God's plan while others stand in awe of it. And we ask this question, how is this possible? How is the eternal plan of God never been thwarted, even though everything Satan threw at it to try and interrupt this thing? How is it possible that this eternal plan has stood the test of time? Well, in verse 11, it says that he purposed or he planned or he accomplished it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but we, the church, are living proof that no power or scheme can undermine what God has established. So, to illustrate this a little bit, let's say... We hopped in a van, all of us. We all can't fit in a van. Maybe a bus, a couple buses. And we decided we're going to take a trip down to the great city of Detroit. We're going to pull up to a construction site. We get there, and nothing's assembled. We see there's concrete bags on the ground. There's bricks kind of piled up. And everything just looks like a mess. And our initial reaction is, is there even a plan here? I know they're working on something, but what is going on? But then the boss steps on the scene. The boss, he's not worried one bit. He's got a blueprint. He's got an eternal purpose that he's following with precision. It's through his wisdom that all of these plans are going to come about and the building is going to be built. Well, because he is so full of wisdom, he's already prepared for when workers call in sick. They say they're sick, but they probably just want to stay home and play Call of Duty or watch movies or something. He's prepared for all of this. Matter of fact, he's even prepared whenever people get injured on the job. Take it a step further. Let's say there's a rival company that wants that land, and their entire goal is to sabotage this boss's plan, this purpose that he has. So they do things in all their ways to try and sabotage and undermine what this boss is trying to do. But yet with every attempt to disrupt the work, it only highlights that the boss is full of wisdom because everything they try, the boss has already known that it's going to happen. He knows that whatever trick they try to pull, he's already one step ahead of them and they're just frustrated. Now, it's so amazing that he's a step ahead in everything that's going on. Some of the workers that work for the boss begin to question him. And say, wait a minute, how in the world is this boss, so full of wisdom, able to stay ahead of everybody? Maybe he's the one that is asking the rival company to do all this just to make himself look better. So you laugh at that, and I do too. But there are literally groups of people that believe that God allows evil to happen in the world. And causes evil to happen in the world just to make himself look good. 
That ain't biblical. What is going on there? No, God in his sovereignty, seeing the entire picture from beginning to end, he sees your life from the beginning to the end. And he knows of everything that Satan is trying to do to cause you to fall, to have you listen to other voices as the video says. He knows everything Satan could do and could be planned for. And in his wisdom, he's fully prepared for it. He's fully prepared for it. He's got a solution to every problem. Why is that? Benjamin Franklin once said, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. And God's plan is eternally set. There's no way that God's plan can fail. And just like the boss in the story, God holds the, holds the complete blueprint for our lives, his eternal plan for the church. Now look back at verse 10. It says, to the intent or for this purpose, now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the entire purpose of Jesus Christ dying on the cross to give us salvation isn't just so we can have a home in heaven. You guys know that, right? If that was the case, when we would get saved, we would automatically just go to heaven. No, there's a job for us to do down here. And Paul says in this passage specifically, the reason why God allowed that plan to orchestrate is for the principalities and the powers to look at it with amazement. There is so much to the gospel that I truly believe throughout all eternity we're going to be talking to God and learning of all the multifacets, all the manifold wisdom that he had in this plan. <clears throat> Why is that? Because God's plan is eternal. Now, I know this is a little bit deep, but I promised you guys when I first started preaching here, we can't skip the hard stuff. So thankfully we have it on YouTube. And if you have questions, when you have questions, I had questions myself. We can talk about this and discuss it a little further, but what is it talking about here? When Jesus was crucified, the angels watched in awe. The demons celebrated thinking they had won. All of heaven and earth witnessed for the first time God turning his back on his own son. It might have seemed that all hope was lost, but when Jesus bowed his head, it wasn't in defeat, it was in victory. For all eternity, we'll look back at this profound wisdom of God, his eternal plan with praise and awe, while Satan and his demons look back on the cross in absolute defeat. Maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, I appreciate the manifold wisdom of God, but I am going through some manifold trials in my life. Could be. And maybe you ask the question, does God really care about me? Can God navigate the challenges that I'm facing? Well, I'm here to tell you that God wants you to trust him. He has a plan. He has a plan. And I'm telling you, if he could prepare and plan and execute a plan from all eternity past with Jesus Christ dying on the cross and rising again from the grave, he can take our little life that is just a tiny little span. But the book of James says it's like a vapor. It's here for a little while and it vanishes away. He can navigate whatever trial you're facing. He has that ability. <clears throat> So God's eternal plan is never wavered, no matter the challenges, showing us that his purpose is unbreakable and filled with wisdom. And this should deepen our trust with, with his plan. Not only that, but it should allow us to live boldly. Number two, if you're taking notes, live boldly by faith in God's plan. I want you to think about a place that you have no hesitation walking into. Now, some of you I know well enough to where I can come up to your house and I don't even have to knock. I can just walk right in. You know I'm coming. I'm not going to be rude like that. Some of you are getting really nervous right now. Like the pastor just shows up and walks in. No. But imagine there's a place where you're comfortable enough that you do. You just, you just walk right in. You feel welcome. There's no hesitancy. Hopefully that's how you felt when you come to this church. But you know what makes a person more comfortable? Usually having somebody to go with them. I know that's simple. But there's something in this passage I want to show you that shows us that we can have the same confidence when we approach God. You ever felt unworthy when you go to pray? Or maybe you feel ashamed because you know you've sinned and you've messed up, and you kind of hesitate and you revert back to what they did in the book of Genesis. You try to hide what you did and you try to hide how you feel. And you're like, well, maybe if I don't tell God, he's not going to find out. I'm telling you, these are the things that we say. Some of you are smiling because you know that's exactly what you think. Others are going, that's foolish. I am above that. That's crazy. Just joking, guys. Calm down. But look at verse 12. It says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. 
That word boldness there, I did some research on it, and I found that it literally means all or every manner of speech. It's a term that reflects complete and total free speech. And on top of that, it means complete freedom in how we approach God. So it's not only what we say, but how we say it. And Paul is saying through Jesus Christ, we have complete and total freedom of speech. That's a big topic that's been going on nowadays. We're not going to get politically or get political, but we'll, uh, we'll skip that one. But in ancient Athens, this word described the right of the citizens to speak openly and without fear, a picture of total freedom. So how can we speak freely? If you look at your Bibles, you'll see it says boldly. We can speak with freedom of speech, but it says we also have access with confidence. You study that word access, you'll find that this is the process of being formally introduced to royalty or someone of a high status. What's that mean? That means, according to scripture, we have the ability to walk into boldly the presence of God. Put that in modern terms. Let's say, just for fun, you thought, man, I want to go talk to President Biden before he has to leave office. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive down and I'm just going to walk right into the Oval Office. Well, he's probably taking a nap, but that's the other, that's, yeah. Wherever he is at the, at the Washington, D.C., you're just going to walk right in. You're going to talk to him. No, we know that's crazy. We're going to get tackled and tased and it's hard to tell what else is going to happen. Because we, we don't have access. But Paul says, because of Jesus Christ, we have access to God. We have the ability to speak freely And that should change the way that we approach God. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 said, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can do so confidently. Now, how does faith come into play? Kind of hit on a little bit, because if you look at verse 12, it says, In whom we have boldness, access with confidence, by the faith of him. The only way and the only reason we have the ability to approach God boldly and we have the access we know is through Christ, but it's also by faith. It's by faith. Now, why do we have to have faith? Well, we have to have faith and believe that what God said is true about us according to his word. You know, so many times we feel like, oh, I'm not worthy enough to go into God's presence. No, you in and of yourself, you're not. But if you are in Christ, if you have been saved, God no longer looks at your unworthiness. He looks at the worthiness of Jesus Christ. When you approach God, you do so as if Jesus is standing beside you and he is giving you full access as if Jesus himself is going to, going to the Father. We have to have faith to believe that. We also have to have faith that God actually cares about what it is we're going through. And then we have to have faith to believe in God's eternal plan. You know, in 1 John, it says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When we pray and we're asking God for guidance, maybe to navigate a tough situation, or maybe you're just wanting to do something between good and great, and you say, God, what decision should I make? We can have boldness, access to God, and by faith, we can believe that if we ask anything according to his will, it's going to happen. But you have to believe that. So many times we are unbelieving believers. It's like, well, I know what the Bible says, but... I mean, does God really care about me? You realize if you were the only one who was going to get saved, God still would have sent his son to die on the cross? He cares about you. And then the tough one is, we have to have faith in God's wisdom. So many times we pray and ask God for direction and leading in our lives, and I say a lot of times... God tells us the two word, the, the word that most little kids hate to hear, no. And then sometimes it's not right now. It's not the right time. And whenever we're praying for something that we think is even good, and God says no or not right now, we still have to, by faith, trust him that he knows what he is doing. That's what Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. This means whatever you're facing this morning, whether it's uncertainty, a struggle, or a problem that seems overwhelming, you can with confidence take it to God. You have direct access to God. You can approach Him boldly with freedom of speech, knowing that He welcomes you fully and trust that He has a solution to your problem. Why? God wants us to trust Him. He has a plan. He has a plan. 
And we can live boldly by faith in God's plan, knowing that he's already made a way for us to come to him with all we need. There's never a time when we approach God in prayer when he says, man, I hope he doesn't or she doesn't bring that up because I just, I don't know what I'm going to do about that situation. And it could be a situation that you yourself put yourself in because sometimes we're boneheads, right, Dave? Amen. Sometimes we make mistakes. We put ourselves in situations where we think, oh man, my back is against the wall. Listen, it didn't take God by surprise. He loves you and he has a plan to navigate it. Now, I'm not going to promise you that the path out isn't going to be difficult, but I do promise you, and so does the word of God, that as you navigate out of that difficult situation, God will be with you every step of the way. We have to have faith in that. And that comes to the third and final point. Don't give up. Trials are part of God's plan. I'll tell you what, if you went to a Joel Osteen church, you're not going to hear that. Every day is a Friday. No, we're going to face some troubles, some trials, and some tribulation. But you can have confidence that it's all part of God's plan. Paul was a guy who practiced what he preached. And that is the challenge of every Christian. A lot of us know truth. As a matter of fact, we know so much truth that when we stand before God on the day of judgment, we're going to have to give an account for a lot because through the freedoms we have in America, we have the ability to learn and dig into God's word and understand so much. But living up to what we know is difficult sometimes. A lot of times. And Paul understood that. Look at verse 13. He said, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. What does that mean? You ever heard a message and you thought, man, that doesn't apply to me. Maybe you felt that about today's message. Your life's perfect. You have no problems. You don't have to worry about if God has a plan or not. Or maybe you came to church for your first time and it was Mother's Day. And you say, well, I don't have to worry about what it means to be a mother because I'm a man, right? Or vice versa. But Paul didn't leave this message vague. He brought it home, per se, And he said, look, these are things that I've had to learn in my own life, and I'm going to show you how I applied what I just told you to my own life. That's what he says in verse 13. He says, wherefore, I desire that you faint not. Now, if you've been here any time at all, I've taught you guys that whenever you see the words wherefore or therefore in your Bible, you need to stop and ask the question, what is it there for? What he is saying is, Paul is saying, everything that I have just told you guys all the way to the beginning of chapter 3. I want you to think about it. And I want you to take that, what I've just taught you, and apply it to my situation. If you study Scripture, you'll see that they actually sent word to Paul because they were concerned about him. If Paul gets his head chopped off because he's facing death in this moment, what does that mean for them? You understand that the Ephesians were living under Roman control as well, and if their leader is going to die outside of Jesus Christ, and they're going to be put to death, there's a good chance they're going to be persecuted as well. And they're thinking, what are we supposed to do here? How are we supposed to respond in this troubling situation? And Paul says this, this is how I want you to respond to your troubling situation. Therefore, based upon everything that I've said, I desire... This wasn't just a wishful thing like kids at Christmas. He said, I am hoping, I am requesting, I'm asking you earnestly this one thing. Do not faint at my tribulations. The word faint here means to lose heart, to become weary, or to feel like giving up. You ever been in that situation? You're going through a trial or tribulation, you think, man, I am just ready to throw in the towel. You feel like a boxer that has been beaten for 10 rounds, and you're just done. And you're like, God, if this is what you have planned, I don't think I can take it anymore. I'm just done. And he says, I know you're at that point in your life. Don't give up. This is part of God's plan. This is part of God's plan. He may not have caused it to happen, but he knew it was going to. And I'm telling you, he has a plan to navigate it. And Paul is saying, look, I'm begging you, don't faint. And he's like, it's as if I'm there as the, re- the letter is being read to you. And the whole time I'm trying to point out, look back at verses 10, 11, and 12. I understand you're worried about me. You're concerned what's going to happen to me. But read those verses again. And he's saying, God has a plan. Do you not think Paul, being in prison, has approached God and said, God, can I get out of here? Do you not think Paul, who's facing death, has not prayed to God and said, hey, I don't want to die. I want to get out of here. 
And that's what he's doing. He said, look, I have learned through my trial that I have the ability because of Jesus Christ to speak boldly and open to God. Because of this trial that I am facing for you, Gentiles, I have learned that I have access to the Father. And I have learned because of this trial, all of this is part of God's eternal plan. And Paul is saying, if I can go through this, not saying that he's better than everybody else, but he's saying, look what, look what God has showed me. You can apply that to your own life. Whether I die or whether I'm set free, it doesn't matter. God has a plan. And then he says it like this in verse 13. He said, I'm desiring that you don't faint because of my trials or tribulations. He said, they're for you. And then he says, it is for your glory. What? Paul, you're in prison for us. You're in chains. You're facing death for us. How does that work? Well, you still have your Bibles handy or at your phone. Look back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. He said, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. I challenge you to go back and listen to that message. But what Paul is saying is, as an apostle, this was entirely part of God's plan for me to be part of the foundation for the church. He's saying, what I'm going through, God has given me revelation so that I can send you this letter. What am I getting at? Maybe you're yourself in a situation like Paul. You're going through a season of suffering or trial. And you know what? You're not behind literal bars. Because if you were, you wouldn't be here this morning. But you feel chained. You feel trapped in a difficult circumstance that seems to have no end. But yet, because of the truth of the Word of God, there's a peace there. There's a joy there because you know what you're going through is part of God's plan. And you know that in this situation, God is able to lead you through it and out of it. And Paul, in God's message this morning is, don't faint. Don't lose faith. Don't, don't, don't get downtrodden in the situation. Stay faithful in those chains. Why? Because there's someone out there who needs the message you carry. It could be that God is using your faithfulness and suffering to write a letter that reaches the heart of a loved one, a neighbor, or a coworker. What do I mean by that? Maybe the chains holding you in place are the very means God is using to deliver his message to other people. What am I getting at? Do you guys realize that everything Paul went through, God used it to reach other people? So many times when we go through trials and tribulations, our natural instinct is to get selfish. It's my time. I'm going to focus on me. I'm going to have me time right now. I'm telling you, you have no idea. If you're saved this morning, whatever it is you're going through, God wants to use that situation to write a letter to speak to somebody else's heart. Are you willing to be faithful in that situation? If you please stand with your head bowed and eyes closed. We don't have a piano player this morning, but I want to remind you, God wants you to trust him. He has a plan. Because of this plan, we can trust God's eternally wise plan. He has wisdom. He can navigate anything. And in that, because there is a plan, we can live boldly by faith in that plan. We have access to God. And then I want to challenge you to persevere through your trials and understand they are a part of God's plan. For those of you this morning that you're saved, you say, you know what? I know if I was to pass away right now and I would stand before God, I know exactly how I'd answer him if he would ask me why I should let you into heaven. You say, the only reason why I am going to be able to enter into heaven is because of the blood of Christ and I'm putting my faith and trust in him. Stay faithful to that. If that's you, continue to trust in the God who loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't experienced this kind of confidence in God's plan. It could be you're not saved. It could be, could be that you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. I ask you here this morning, man, you say, man, my life is tough right now. Or maybe you're in the other situation where life is good, but you still don't have a relationship with God. I'm going to tell you, God has a plan for your life, and it's greater than anything that you could ever come up with. 
you're here this morning, you're not saved, challenge you. I beg you, put your faith and trust in God. He's never going to let you down. And look what he went through. Look at the plan that he laid out just to have a relationship for you. I'll give you a moment to pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can live boldly. We can confidently approach you. And I'm thankful, Lord, that you had a plan for whenever we messed up. Thankful that this plan can never be thwarted by anything by Satan. Lord, I pray for those here this morning that they're going through a tough time. Pray that you will remind them of the truths of your word, that you want to navigate them out of this tough situation, and that they can have a relationship with you and have joy even in the midst of their trials. Lord, I pray for those here this morning that are not saved. I pray you convict them, convince them of the truth of your word, and show them that this is the best life that they can live, a relationship with you. Lord, we love you and thank you, and I pray that you help us to trust you this week because you have a plan. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.